What do you think is the most important trait to achieve excellence? Persistence. 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 Practice. Practice. Self-discipline. I think these are all really, really good points, and, and I'm going to be hitting on all of them. Okay? The first thing that I think you need to have to achieve excellence. Confidence in yourself. Okay? Now, what I mean by this is not overconfidence. We know a lot of people are over, overconfident, but a belief in yourself. Okay? So what are some examples of that? Well, first, you have to exhibit, exhibit that to the outside world. Okay? How do you do that? Basic things I'm mentioning. Sounds silly. Handshake, firm handshake. Look people in the eye when you talk at a meeting. Look in the eye, eye contact. All these things are very, very, very helpful. Your resume. Simple example. So my nephew, who was in a class a few weeks back, sent me his resume. It lacked confidence. Okay, how did it, how did it demonstrate that? Way too much stuff. Small font, couldn't read it. Because of the lack of confidence, he had to put everything he did since he was 12 in it. No. Think about what matters. And then think about how to sell yourself. So I said to him, Corey, weren't you the first intern ever promoted to analyst at the company's history? Yeah, I was. It's not on your resume. Don't you work on the account for General Electric, the, you know, the third largest company in the world, on the biggest environmental program ever? Yeah, I do. It's not on your resume. Okay. Be confident. Sell yourself. Okay. So a lot of things in life, and these are very much interrelated, <coughs> confidence and selling. My wife looked at this slide and had the word selling originally in it, and she said, I don't like it. Because there's a negative connotation with selling. But in anything you do, you have to sell. And it's very interrelated, selling and, and confidence. Job interviews mention the same thing. Go in, project the way you project yourself. Somebody here mentioned posture. Somebody here uh, mentioned uh, how you talk. Speaking too much, not having intonation. All this stuff plays into confidence in selling oneself. Asking for things. Some people might never ask for a job promotion. You should. If you think you've done a good job, you go in and you say, you know, when might I expect a promotion? What metrics are you going to use to measure me by? You could say, oh, they're going to view that as a negative. But you know what? A good manager will view it as a positive. This is somebody who cares about their career and wants to do well. So be, be confident. Don't be arrogant, but be confident. Getting meetings with busy people, OK? Everybody likes to think they're important. I learned early on, because I was brainwashed by my parents, that no one is as important as you. You're as, you're as important as anybody. You want a meeting with anybody, you deserve it. Okay? Be prepared, be confident. Running meetings with powerful people. You go, you're thrown into a meeting. I, I gave you some examples a few classes ago when I was 25 and Jerry Colbert would be in a conference room with me. And he'd leave and he'd say, Jeff, run the meeting. And I'd have a bunch of 50-year-old lawyers looking at me like, I hate this kid. What am I doing in this meeting with him? How am I gonna, why am I going to listen to him? But I, I got great experience at a very, very young age. So when you have those opportunities, jump at them. If your bosses leave a room, take charge. Be confident. Be prepared. Other examples where it's going to come into play. Well, some of your classmates talked about raising money for an investment idea. They had a big meeting. Well, it was great that they reached out to an expert. That showed confidence. Okay? And hopefully they went into that meeting and had a very short presentation and could do it all on, on, uh, on one foot. Coaching and inspiring others. At your jobs, you'll probably be managing people, managing outside people. Same thing. Do it confidently.
Friendship. Okay. Uh, probably one of the most important things in life. If you look at studies on, on happiness, relationships sort of are at the top of the list. So friendships, family. Presenting investment ideas. This is something, if I mention it to you again today and then we do it again next week, realize that's nothing. People at Fir Tree, we mention this to them on a weekly basis. We have a quarterly meeting, we'll pull you aside and say, wait a minute, it should have been crisper, cleaner, simpler. Writing is, is rewriting. So these are the big points that I want you to always think about. Clear, short. No one wants to read anything long when you, when you can cut Cut. Cut sentences, cut words, make it clear. People you work with are going to be super busy. If you get known in work, at work as somebody who hands really long memos that you have to read for 15 minutes to get the, the point over to your boss, it's career killing, even if what you write is wonderful. All right? So make it, your job is to make the job easy for the people who you work with. So punchline right away, standing on one foot, what it all means. And then if they want to read the rest of it, they can. Okay? That's what you should be focusing on. So simple, clear, um, where people who are with you can get this story very, very quickly. Um, I may have mentioned this, this Winston Churchill quote. A lot of people have been uh, attributed to this quote, Mark Twain. Uh, but it's Totally true. I'm going to bring something in next week to show you it. Um, writing something short takes a lot more work than writing something long. <laughs> Distilling this to these, I don't know, seven bullets was a lot more work than crowding it up with 17. I was going through it. Take, no, I don't need that. That's not necessary. So cut, cut, cut. Simple sentences. Writing is rewriting. This is 17 versions of the PowerPoint presentation. That's what it took. Killing lingo, OK? You're going to meet a lot of people, and you probably met a lot of them in business already, who are going to have a lot of fun talking fancy terms. They read a 10K, or they read an annual report, and they start talking in words with 17 syllables. Clear clarity. You know, Albert Einstein would, would do his best to explain the theory of relativity in a language that a seven-year-old can understand. And that's how you should, you should write. Um, and then finally, I, I put up here example, sovereign investing made simple. So we have a team of folks at Fertree who've done an absolutely extraordinary job um, doing what, what we'll call almost a Bible for how to invest in a sovereign country. So before the past year or two, um, we were investing in sovereign countries episodically. You know, once every three or four years, there'd be something in Brazil or in Latin America or Eastern Europe. But mostly we're doing corporate stuff. In corporate land, it's fairly easy. You understand your revenue and income, right? Not that hard. In sovereign land, it's GDP and GDP per capita and fiscal account and current account. And oh my God, it's, it's mind boggling. And so we said to our, our team members, we would like you to redefine sovereign investing in the language of company investing. We want to look at countries like companies. So what's the revenue? GDP. OK. What's the income statement? What's the EBITDA? What's EBIT? What's the balance sheet? And so we redefined everything. So when, if you were to see our investment memos on, should we invest in, Greece, in Greek bonds, it'll look like, should we invest in the bonds of a certain company? We simplified it. Really hard, hard work. Nothing we've ever seen done really on, on Wall Street, but that's the type of work you should strive towards. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one other story. Some of our team members, Clinton Biondo, um, uh, Jim Walker, Joseph C., and, and uh, Brian Meyer, four key players at Virtue right now, are working on a structured products investment that involves um, an insurance uh, obligation that's guaranteed by a bank, that has a swap guaranteed by another bank. You could draw diagrams and get dizzy in terms of where all the money moves back and forth. And they worked really hard at, at doing an initial memo. And even, even, uh, even that group, who's incredibly talented, the first memo was a little bit hard to understand if you weren't part of that working group. 
And uh, so they needed to redo it because no one can be a devil's advocate if the non-working group people can't understand. So they redid it. And now they've done it to a, a wonderfully sim simple, um, they brought it down to a simple analysis that's very helpful. So these are things I'd like um, to stay with you. Simple. People are busy. You have to think about, if you're in the shoes of the other person, how quickly can you deliver that message? And again, I'll tell you, there are wonderful people who work with me who are brilliant who are still working on this. Can we encourage them to you know, get on their iPads or, or if they've got a video, record themselves and see if they can do it quicker and clearer? And uh, folks, some, some folks who have been with me three or four years, still working on it. <coughs> Same concepts, plain English, simple, short, people zone out. Um, the News Corp, practice doing it in 30 seconds, standing on a leg. I actually gave you uh, some time. <laughs> Target. You probably thought that was a little excessive, but I think you know, you're know you going to work on it. We'll see. You get the stopwatches out because that's, that's the real world. You're in a meeting at Fir Tree. We're busy. Everybody's talking about a prospect that they want to look at. You should be able to go. News Corp. I think the opportunity exists because there was a hacking scandal which led to the stock price going down. Four questions. I think it's cheap because the stock price dropped by $9, $9 billion. I think it's only a $1 billion or $200 million obligation. Quality business, EBIT's gone up 9 out of 10 years. The margins are high. The return on capital is average, but high without tangibles. Management, <coughs> neutral, but a new guy who has a very, very good record. Catalyst is share buyback. Okay, 30 seconds. Um, and that's what you should be able to, to do on an investment. Uh, again, people zone out. And if you get a reputation for somebody who can do that, People will want to hear you speak, which is really cool. Instead of, instead of them rolling their eyes and saying, oh, God, it's him again, it's just going on. Um, and, and try to sense that with your, with your audience. I think to, to, to achieve excellence, again, my opinion, you need time. I think one of the biggest issues you have in your lives right now is, uh, are, are these things. What is this? Is that a tape recorder? Uh, iPhones, iPads, Blackberries. It's this. To me, this is it. Okay? Let's just take a look at the slide for a moment. Okay. This is what our lives are becoming. You're on your phone. Okay, you're playing with your gadgets, doing other things. You, you can see he's doing some other things here. It's just too much, okay? To be on the toilet, on your phone, reading your computer, on TV, with the Financial Times at your feet. Everybody has too many things thrown at them. So I think given that, to achieve excellence, this is critical. To manage information overload, okay? Hugely important. You've got all these overwhelming inputs coming at you. News, email, IMing, Facebook, phone calls. I, mean, I, I don't even know what all the whole list is, okay? We can't think straight. We have the, remember, we have the caveman brain. Cavemen did not have this, okay? Basically, we had to spear the mastodon and bring it back to the cave, right? We didn't have to do 17 things at the, at the, at the, at, at the same time. Um, and it does impair rational decision making. How do you restrict inputs? First of all, um, you've got to fight. It's a fight in this world to minimize it. And my daughter's here, and she knows too well, because she doesn't get to watch probably as much television as her friends, or to go into the computer maybe as much, but trying to minimize the inputs so our family can think a little more. Um, it's difficult when all these inputs are coming um, towards you. Creating regularly scheduled quiet time. Uh, it was... Somebody in my office who did this, he was coming into the office an hour late. And I said, Amin, what's going on? He said, you know what? I can read and think more clearly at home. I said, it's great that you're scheduling quiet time, but that tells me that something's wrong with our office environment. And we actually changed the setup so it could be quieter. 
these are some other ideas on restricting inputs you can read about. I think on the prioritization, this is, this is an important point, which is really focus on what are the most important things for you to do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, and then think about when is your best time. I used to love working on the weekends because the phone didn't ring, okay? but that doesn't really work for me anymore with three young kids. So now it's late evenings, early mornings, or when they're at school, um, in the office, I would try to schedule blocks of meeting times, okay, and blocks of just quiet time. Because if you have meetings constantly, you can't really think. Um, hold my phone calls for three hours. I don't, you know, there are not too many emergencies in our lives. As much as we, we think we need to get every single phone call, we don't. So think about, think about that. It's hard to do, but you'll be a lot more productive. The um, return on effort is something we like to talk about at Fertree a lot, which is we don't want to be the hardest working firm in the world. We want to be the smartest working firm in the world. Okay, and what does that mean? It means some of the things I've been mentioning over the past six weeks. Figure out what matters, figure out the quickest way to get the, the answers, quick, quickest and most efficient way, and figure out the best time to do that work. So that's a big thing we focus on at Fertree. The last point I make here is I think it's really important to get away from the office. Something I used to do every year, I used to go away to some semi-exotic place and um, it could be the jungles of Guatemala, uh, the beaches of Costa Rica, and I just bring three or four thought-provoking books and my notepad. And I'd read to try to get ideas, ideas for my life, ideas for what I love to do. And it was incredibly um, pivotal in terms of getting me where I am today. And, and I, I feel like, for me, I'm where I wanted to be. So having that time where I disconnected was really vital. Disconnecting, it could be going camping for two, two days. It could be just whatever you view as getting away. Perhaps not even taking your phone, right? Getting away to think about your life. Um, really vital. And I, I did that probably for, from ages 20 to 40 every year. Buffett, we talked about Buffett. And I just want you to reread. And what I find fascinating about it, so he's successful by virtually all measures, very happy, does what he loves, second or third richest person in the world, I think. Um, he doesn't read email, not watching TV, spends 80% of his time in the office reading, right? And he said it could be even more, more than that. So think about that. Okay, it's not jumping from meetings to meeting and jumping on planes. No, one of the most productive, at least economically productive people in our world um, has gotten there through thinking and reading. So you want to become excellent at something. Who should you, who should you try to learn from? Exactly. People who have already done it. Okay? They're out there. So we're going to talk about that. Mentors and learning from the best. Hugely important, okay? I've mentioned this briefly, but I want to stress it. You learn more from them and faster finding great mentors. You build powerful networks, okay? Because talented people travel in packs. So if you're into Google and you work for Sergey Brin, You'll see the top 10 lieutenants for him created Zynga or 12 other companies like that. And you'll find the same thing in the investing landscape. People who worked for George Soros hung out together after and started businesses together. People learned from Buffett and so on. So you get very, very powerful networks. People travel in clusters. Very important. It also increases the future opportunities. Okay. Great mentors can help open doors dramatically. Many times it happens grudgingly, right, or against their will, right? If you work for Steve Jobs at Apple, 
and you were leaving to start a technology company, it opened doors. He might have tried to fight you. He might not have helped that door get open. But if you were one of his key designers or marketing people, absolutely doors open. So working for great people, doors open. Let's say one of two scenarios happens. You get that great mentor, right? But you want to learn from some other mentors that aren't there. Or you don't get that great mentor. You get a B plus mentor, a B or a B minus mentor, which happens, right? It may happen to a lot of us. I've certainly had those jobs. What do you do? <clears throat> the mentors I learn the most from, what I call secondary mentors, books. You can get advice from the world's smartest people in books that have been written about them, watching interviews with them. I have learned so much from this method. So when I was going away annually, this is a lot of what I was doing, learning from what I, what I call um, virtual mentors, people who were maybe not even alive anymore, but who could teach me, because they're the best. I can never get a job with them. They're dead, right? But they're great. And uh, I'd encourage you all to find, you know, when you figure out what it is you're interested in, find the best mentors and find the virtual mentors. The, um, you know, you want to be, a, you want to be a, a venture capitalist? Watch the interviews with John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins, okay? You want to be a ma macro investor? Read some of the Soros stuff. Watch some interviews um, with him. You want to be an artist? Study Da Vinci's drawings. You know, there's just a wealth of opportunity out there. I've got some friends that have learned all their management techniques from Jack Welch at General Electric, one of the greatest managers ever. But two of them in particular never met Jack Welch. They just read his books. And it's helped incredibly. So seek out those mentors. And if you can't get a live one, there's plenty of, plenty of them you can find without um, having to get them in the real flesh. Ben Franklin, I thought this was an interesting story. I read a biography of Ben Franklin. And uh, his dad said, Benjamin, you're an absolutely terrible writer. This is Ben Franklin, one of the founding fathers. And he decided he wanted to get good at writing. So what he did was he found some of the greatest written pieces, mostly essays, put them at his work desk, and he cut out the words individually. So we'd read an essay or a speech, cut out the words individually, mix them all up, and then he tried to recreate these essays and speeches. That's how Ben Franklin taught himself how to write. So he picked the best writers, dissembled them. I think it's just a good example that you could see somebody uh, of that um, regard. All right. 39th richest person in the world, coincidentally right before he died, was, or in the U.S., was Steve Jobs. When I was a little younger than you, I was graduating college, I wrote a letter to the then 39th richest person in the United States. And this is an example of just reaching out to people. You'll be shocked. Wouldn't you be shocked if Steve Jobs wrote you back? Well, now you'd really be shocked, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but six months ago, pretty amazing, right? So in 1984, and I, we managed to find a copy of it. Here it is. This is a letter I wrote to Walter Annenberg. Okay, so Walter Annenberg was an incredible entrepreneur 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. He created the TV Guide. Okay, this business was making a few million dollars a week in profit at a time when that was considered absolutely extraordinary. And this was a paper guide that showed you what was on television. Created Seventeen magazine. Okay, so this is his response to me. I had written him a letter for advice. I was thinking about a JD MBA program, thinking about working, what should I do? And he wrote back, um, which was amazing. He gave me some advice. I didn't follow his advice, which is okay. 
But the, the point is, I was learning and reaching out to heroes and mentors. And I think it's important to have heroes and mentors. He was a hero of mine because he sort of was involved with three areas of interest. He was an entrepreneur, which I wanted to be. He was a politician. He, he was uh, appointed to the, uh, the Court of St. James, so he was the U.S. ambassador to England. And um, he was also a very big philanthropist. And these were all areas that interested me as a young person. So I'd written letters to a handful of folks, and amazingly they wrote back. So I just, I'm putting that up to you because I didn't have any magic formula. I didn't know him. Um, reach out to your, hero, your heroes and mentors. Greatness um, is made through practice, okay? not, not birth. And I'm a real big believer in this. I've seen it with friends. I've seen it with colleagues. I've seen it with business people, athletes. This is what makes greatness. Seven specific points on this. And this, this is mostly pulled out of a book called Town is Overrated. There's a footnote, I believe, on this page if you want to read it. Uh, but if you don't want to read it, I'm summarizing it to you in two minutes. Specific practice designed with potentially the help of a coach. Okay? Where you break the practice down into its component parts. So let's take the speaking you, ju you just did. Good example. One component part was eye contact, right? One component part was posture. One component part was tone. One component part was um, how many words you, you mentioned. So you'd practice all that, potentially separately, and then pull it together. Regularly repeating practice, so regularly working on it, which is something we do at FIRTS. We we're always working on this stuff. If we're going to present or have meetings, we challenge each other. We, we, um, we do mock meetings. If we're going to be interviewing a, a management team, right? someone will make believe they're the CEO. And they'll sit in the meeting, and we'll have somebody fall asleep. Right? What's it like to be in a meeting when, when your audience is falling asleep? How do you get their attention? Do you go... What do you do? These are things we would put each other through to learn. Important. Stretching yourself. Hugely important thing. So there's some of you today that did your oral presentations, and you can do way better. And you may be thinking, you know what? This is good enough for me. I don't really like doing this. Okay. I'd encourage you to stretch yourself. Push yourself. You can do way, way, way better. Getting feedback, hugely important. Again, this is something we do at Fir Tree. Right after meetings, we ask for feedback. And we want junior people giving senior people feedback, senior people giving junior people feedback. It's a great thing. And it's an unusual culture. If you could impact your culture and have that done, really, really good. Last few items on, uh, on deliberate practice. It's exhausting. Okay, it's not easy, it's tiring, all right? Really, really tiring. Um, and it's not what I call rote practice. It's not sitting down and saying, I'm doing my 30 minutes of piano and just sort of moving through it, or I'm gonna kick 10 balls into the soccer net with my left foot and my right foot. No, it's intensely trying to do each one the best you can possibly do it. Very, very different. Okay, there's rote practice, which is what 90% of what the world does, and then there's intense, exhausting practice, which is what very, very few people do. Not fun, because it's demanding, and because we're working on things that we're bad at. Again, coming back to the oral presentations we did. Not fun working on it over and over again, but what is fun is the final product of being able to deliver a wonderful, targeted speech. There's lots of people you read about who do it. There's millions of people you read about it who don't because of their specialty not being well known or cared about or they're doing, they're doing excellence in a, very, in, in a way that doesn't merit um, news coverage. So tons of ordinary people doing extraordinary things by following these seven Seven key points.
I have a book in here that I wanted to mention you. I mentioned it in an earlier class. It's called Moonwalking with Einstein. Okay, there are lots of books like this out there. This is what I found fascinating. I just finished it about a week or so ago. So there was a, uh, an online journalist, your age, about roughly 27 years old, and he was writing articles for a blog. And he stumbled across a, uh, a memory contest. I didn't know this world existed. He didn't know this world existed. It was a championship in the United States for memory. You know, big championship TV coverage. And they had activities like, who can remember these cards the fastest? So they'd show you 52 cards, and you had to memorize them and write them down in the order you saw them. So jack of spades and king of hearts, etc. And then you were shown 100 cards with people's faces and names. And then you were given the cards without the names, and you had to write them down, their names. And then you were shown a poem, and you were given five minutes to memorize the poem. So he was interviewing these people, and he said, God, these people are freaks. How do they know all this stuff? They can memorize a deck of cards in two minutes. They can remember you know, a five-page poem in five minutes. And he started interviewing scientists, saying, well, what do they have? Do they have photographic memories? What's going on here? What he actually discovered was fascinating. <coughs> he brought them to a, a number of science labs. They didn't have anything different with their brain than a normal person. They were using specific techniques. They found mentors, techniques that were developed during the, the Greek and Roman periods, which is fascinating, that disappeared when the Gutenberg print, printing press was created. As a species, we used to have to memorize a lot. When I was a kid, I had to memorize phone numbers. I don't have to memorize phone numbers anymore. We don't use our memories anymore. Okay, so as a species, our memory is amazing. So as he's doing his project, he came up with a crazy idea. He said, I'm going to find a mentor, and I'm going to enter the US memory championships in, in a year. Okay, and this goes through the story of him. You know, putting earplugs in and, and learning all these techniques. He is the US world champion in memory in one year. Okay? He found mentors, deliberate practice, painful, constant feedback. He set the US record for memorizing um, cards. I think he did it in less than a minute. To me, the lesson is not one of I want to be a memory champion. The lesson is, after he won the memory championship, he went back to the science labs and said, let's CAT scan my brain, let's see what the differences are. Came back to the same thing we all have, which is we, we roughly have the ability to memorize seven to nine things without some of these tips and some of this deliberate practice that he went through. So my message to all of you on this is, you can all, all achieve things of greatness. It takes having the right mentors, practicing, and pushing through the hard stuff. And uh, this book that I just finished is a wonderful example. Work habits. So now specific work habits. So at Fir Tree, uh, we always focus on doing the hard stuff first. So when you're working on an investment idea, there's stuff that's easy and fun to do, and there's stuff that's not fun to do and not easy. Okay, so sort of thinking, you, you just had a meeting with the management team. It's exhausting. It was a six-hour meeting, lots of questions. You just want to go out to dinner, okay? What do you do at our firm? Right then, when it's fresh, you write down what you learned. That's the hard stuff, okay? So that's the do real-time. You see the wrong habit, and this is a real-world real, real world example. I was with somebody who was working with me at Fir Tree. We had a bunch of magic meetings uh, away from the office. And then we get on the plane. And I'm writing down what I learned and what I didn't learn and what are the critical path issues remaining. And he's reading Sports Illustrated. Okay? I'm his boss. He's sitting next to me reading Sports Illustrated. And I'm working, figuring out what I learned and what we have to do next. He no longer works at Fir Tree. Okay? Um, that's the point. The hard stuff first. And then enjoy yourself. Then go to the pub, OK? So that's a vital, vital work habit that we hit on over and over again at the firm. Meetings. 
This is something hopefully you're all going to be doing a lot of, running meetings. Okay. How do you run a good meeting? First thing we always do, get the bio of the people you're going to be having the meeting with. Absolutely vital. Because you want to be able to connect with them. Where they go to college? Maybe they wrote some articles you can read in advance. Okay? Maybe they're members of a certain club. You want to connect with people. You want to know those people incredibly well before they've walked into that room with you. And you want to do the same thing when you're going on an interview and get any of the names of the people that are going to interview you. Absolutely critical thing. Know the key objectives, okay? It's a given, but know them in the context of if that meeting is going to get cut short. I've been in meetings, and I thought I was going to have an hour with this management team. In seven minutes, they say, I apologize, something came up. I, I have five more minutes, right? You need to know when you go into meetings, if that meeting is going to get cut to almost nothing, what do you care about? What are the six questions you're really going to ask? Vital to running a good meeting, having a good meeting. OK. Meeting them. Open up. OK. Show some vulnerability. What I, what I have found is that there are a lot of meetings you go into. And in, in the investment business in particular, the investment manager acts like they're the prosecution and the management team is the witness, OK? Like they're on the witness stand. Oh, OK, you're gonna, how are earnings going? Why did you mess up with this? And what's going on with that? And all of a sudden, all the management team can think about is, I can't wait for this meeting to end. Right? You don't want that to be you. Tell them a little bit about yourself. Open up. Show some vulnerability. Connect. Same, from, same concept in terms of starting from general and going to specific questions. Start general. Don't go into nitty-gritty right away. All right. Last few points on running good meetings. Tie out the numbers. Triangulate the numbers. Come at them lots of different ways if you're doing investment meetings. Um, the, um, next point is something that relates to confidence. Don't fear asking the same question over and over again. Don't care if they think you're an idiot. Ask that. If you don't understand it, chances are somebody else doesn't understand it. If it's an accrual policy or a litigation issue, anything, say, I apologize. Can you explain it to me again? In fact, you know what the ironic thing is about doing that? It shows confidence. Being able to look a manager team in the eye and say, I don't understand that. Would you mind telling me again? Saying that three times shows self-confidence. Don't be shy about doing it. Connect personally, we talked about. And I tend to be really impressed when I get a snail mail thank you, a written letter. OK? Everybody gets way too much email. But you'll be a standout if you meet with somebody and you write them a letter and put a postage stamp on it. So just think about that. Negotiation. OK. Firstly, obvious, but. I'm going to state the obvious. You've got to know what you want, and you have to really know what, what really, really matters to you whenever you go into negotiation. Okay. Second is, there are lots of styles that work. There's the screamer, jump on the table. They, they look like they're going to take out a gun or a knife. And then there's just a calm approach. Um, at Fir Tree, our style is much more calm. We don't get, try not to get emotional um, when we're negotiating. And we're just open and honest. The next point is what is one I want to stress. Don't fear negotiations. I have partners who fear them, friends who fear them. If you're going to negotiate with somebody and say, look, um, we only want to pay this price, not that price, price, they'll avoid it. No, say it with a smile. And this is all I think we can pay. Right? Uh, or if you're negotiating your compensation, same thing. I think I should get paid more, and these are the reasons why. Can we discuss it? Don't fear negotiations. They're not to be feared, okay? especially if you do it calmly and if you've prepared for it. Next point on excellence. I think another thing that helps you to achieve excellence is to have a better mousetrap. Okay? 
So it could be you've got a better uh, drug if you're a pharmaceutical company, a better product if you're Apple, um, or a better business model if you're fir tree, okay, a fund manager. So what we've done is it's really tough to have an advantage in the investment business, right? All of you are willing to work as hard, if not harder, than everybody on my team. All of you are probably as smart as everybody on my team. So if, if you're all willing to work as hard and you're as smart, what do we need to do to create an advantage? We need a different business model. We're going to play by different rules. You guys can play by other rules. We're going to win because we've got different rules to play by. So the rules we're playing by, we have more patient money than most of our competitors. So multi-year money in hedge fund space is a ma major advantage. We can invest in situations that take a longer time to go up. We can buy when the world is selling. So when Greek decides they're going to go out of the euro, if they do, or get pushed out, or something like that happens and markets collapse, we can potentially buy things when everybody's selling and they're worrying about redemptions. Those are advantages. Having a broad mandate at Fir Tree is an advantage. Constantly pushing for innovation with our team members is an advantage. Having lived through the Russia crisis, the long-term capital management crisis, the Lehman crisis, subprime crisis, these are all advantages. So think about competitive advantage personally. How can you make yourself advantaged? What can you do to professionally make yourself advantaged? And also the business you work with. Constantly, it's a question we're constantly asking. How can we create advantages in our business model other than just working harder? Now I'm going to talk about failure, okay? Um, and the importance of failure. So I'm going to go through just a handful of failures I've had, okay? I'm going to edit a few. Um, first is, I had to take mat retake math over summer school in high school. Okay? I didn't pay attention. I don't remember if it was geometry or algebra. I had to take one of them over. That was a failure. Uh, when I arrived in college, I remember calling my mother first semester and saying, Mom, I apologize, I'm just not ready for college. They had given us preliminary grades and there were C's and D's. And uh, she said, believe in you, don't worry, stick it out. Um, and I stuck it out. So that's another example. Um, law school. I had a summer associate position, and uh, I think I was one of the few summer associates that didn't get a job offer. I worked at a law firm over a summer, and I was getting a jade, an, M an MBA also, and maybe they knew that and didn't feel like I was likely to become a lawyer. I probably telegraphed that, but still, it would have been nice to have the offer and then not have taken it, then to have not gotten it. Um, when I looked for my job after, during grad school, the number of rejections I got, incredible. But not just, you know, not just letters, but phone calls, because I was trying to go about it lots of different ways, calling people or setting up meetings. Rejection after rejection, don't take them personally. They don't know you. The rejections you should take personally are from the people that love you. And then when I worked at Kohlberg, there were some partners much older than I was who um, it was a failure in the sense that they weren't big boosters of mine. Um, the head of the firm was, which was great. But there were others that I didn't get on with that well. Um, and that was a failure. So my point is that we're all going to have failures. And the key is what do you do with those failures? So this is my view on failure. Uh, okay, skip, we can get that. Learn as much from failure as you can. There's always good stuff to learn from it. So college. Let's go back to the college example. I was almost failing out this first semester. I went to my economics teacher, and I said, you know, I, I never really learned how to study. And she gave me a little bit of advice, and I went home, and I studied. And I rewrote my notes condensed them, and I rewrote them again, and rewrote them again, <coughs> condensed, condensed, outlined them, 
like something I'd never done over and over again. I went in, and I'll never forget this, got the exam back, and I got a 48 and a half out of 50, I got the highest grade in the class, and I got an A on every single exam I ever took at that college again, graduated number two out of about five, 6,000 students. And the key is not that I got the A's, that's, that's okay. It's that I, I took a failure opportunity and turned it into a success. So learn, learn from your failures. Next is control as many variables as you can so you don't fail, right? And um, if you're going to start a business, think about what's controllable, right? So the uh, a couple of your classmates who want to start this business in Mongolia, that was really my question, which is, you know, in Mongolia, how do you fail? Well, you think you own real estate and you find out in a week later you don't. So are there are things legally you can do or partner-wise you can do to take that risk of failure off the table. So always think about that um, when you're starting a business or when you have a job or really in any initiative. What can you control? These are some interesting things. So first I found two very famous Cambridge alumni that failed before they came to Cambridge. Newton and Darwin were considered failures by their family and actually were sent to Cambridge because their parents said, your failures, just go to Cambridge. <laughs> so hopefully that's not what happened with you all. But hey, uh, I think we're, we're all pretty happy that we have Newton and, um, and Darwin. And then a few quotes. I mean, many of you probably know the J.K. Rowling stories of her living out of her car and divorced and no one's reading her manuscripts. She learned. She persisted. She practiced. Thomas Edison. Thousand failures. He didn't view it that way. But it took him a thousand tries to get the light bulb working. Uh, James Dyson, who I love, um, who the Americans don't know a lot about, but uh, I think he said he, he tried... Does he say it in this quote? Yeah, he does. 5,000 failures to reinvent that vacuum. Love it. And who loves that thing that, with the air blade when you go in the bathroom now? It actually dries your hand? James Dyson. I don't know how many thousands of attempts it took to create that. But failures. Okay? And then the big American basketball player, Michael Jordan, cut from his high school basketball team. So failure is hugely important. The key is to not let it stand in your way, to learn from it. To me, these are the final things that you need for excellence. Passion, number one, by far and away. Do something you love. Okay, we have people come in. Everybody wants to work at a hedge fund now. You're smart. You make some money. But they're not passionate. All right? I'd rather hire somebody who didn't go to a fancy school breathes this and loves this. So find something that you really, really love because it will show otherwise. You know, for example, the example I gave of, of that summer job at the law firm, sure it showed. I remember they gave me an assignment where I was checking footnotes and I had zero, zero interest in it or in the career and I'm sure it showed. I would have been a very average lawyer, certainly wouldn't have made partner, would have been unhappy most likely, but I found something I loved. And through deliberate practice and finding mentors, strove towards excellence. Character. Um, it's a lesson I learned early on from my, my dad and mom, who said, they used something uh, uh, that we call in New York, the New York Times rule. Okay. Never do anything that you wouldn't want your parents to read about on the cover of the New York Times. Okay? It's a great test. We're, we're, you're, we're all faced with ethical dilemmas. Okay? I remember right after I started Fur Tree, um, there was a medical device company that needed some money, and I was gonna, we were going to invest some money in it, and they said, help us raise some more money. And we said, sure. And he said, you know what, if you help us raise that additional money from all those other people, we'll pay you a $1 million bonus fee. 
And I said, well, you know, can I tell them about it? And he said, no, I don't want you telling the other people about it because then they're going to think you're convincing them to invest in this because of this $1 million fee that I'm paying you. And so I laid up. I was lying awake that night thinking, $1 million, wow. It's my first year in business. That would be really an awesome thing. And then the other side of me said, how would I feel about reading that in the New York Times? that I got all these people to invest in this medical device company because I gave a presentation, and they didn't know that I was going to get this million-dollar payment. And I went back to them the next day, and I said, you know what, Don? I'll help you raise that money. Tell me to invest, but I don't want the million-dollar payment. And his jaw dropped. I was like, what? Are you human? And uh, I said, yeah. And so the most important thing you have is not money. It's your, your reputation. So. All of you are going to be compromised, or people are going to try to compromise you. Integrity is numero uno. You lose everything, you feel good about your reputation and yourself, that's enough to have. Being patient, we talked about that. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that uh, more, but don't be in a hurry. Uh, and there's a, the last slide, you'll see why. Intellectual curiosity. Being a lifelong learner, I have to tell you, it's so exciting, constantly learning. So reading this book I just read on Einstein, on Einstein and memory and thinking about how can I apply this to my life, my family, my business. So just asking questions and always trying to learn is a wonderful, wonderful thing to bring to your life and your, your career. All right. Investor versus football player. Messi. It's almost over for this guy. He's 24. Think about that. He's got three years, four years, and then it's, all right? He's got a lot of glory right now. He better have it because it's going away. He's going to have a pot belly and, you know, who knows what, lose his hair and it's over for Messi. Irving Kahn, okay? Turned 106 this year. He's alive was the second teaching assistant for Ben Graham at Columbia Business School. Okay. He's still getting better in many ways, if you listen to him. He's still learning and getting better. So if you can have a career where you keep on getting better, that's exciting, right? So see if you can find things where you can keep on getting better. So here's a question for the group. Really quickly, whoever raises your hand first, he started with $10,000 when he's 25. If he increased that investment at 15% per year, which is a little lower than Fir Tree's gross returns, how much would that $10,000 be worth now? Nippeth, you're up. Take a guess. $10,000 when, when, when he was your age, how much is it worth today? $718 million. Okay? It shows you the virtue of patience. Right? So I thought that was a... Uh, a good, a good uh, conclusion to the, the lecture on excellence because I think Irving Kahn really um, exhibits a lot of things I've, I've been talking about during the lecture.